Our first study contrasted the commandment Jesus gave, known as the Golden Rule, with three other commonly practiced rules regarding how you can treat other people. We saw that God does not approve of forcing your will on another because you have power in a certain area, which was the iron rule. We saw that God does not approve of treating others how they treat you, known as the brass rule. And we saw that even doing no harm to others is not entirely what God desires from your conduct toward others, which is known as the silver rule. Instead, the standard Jesus sets for how you must treat others is the golden rule that is given in Matthew 7 and verse 12. Jesus said, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The standard for your conduct toward others must be how you want others to treat you. This certainly involves refraining from harming people in any way as you would not want others to harm you. And this also involves doing good to people in the ways you would want people to do good to you. This is such a simple yet transformational idea. You see, the fact of the matter is that people do not treat others in this way much of the time. People are often too self-absorbed to see the true needs of others and act in the best interest of the others. And then even when this golden rule is practiced, it is often only practiced toward certain people. Yet Jesus' commandment is much more far-reaching than this. Those who are Christians must be determined to live differently from the normal activities that are seen throughout the world. This is because the ways of the world are contrary to the ways of God. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. So Romans chapter 12 in verses 1 and 2 instructs Christians to give themselves entirely to the Lord and to live in a transformed kind of way. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12 is one of the many commandments involved in God's law that will transform us from the ways of the world to a true imitator of Jesus Christ. So having established what the golden rule says in lesson one, let's consider the many ways that it will transform us. If we will live according to Jesus' teaching, it will transform our thoughts, our words, our conduct, and our relationships. Let's begin by recognizing this is a transformational commandment for our thoughts. One of the most important elements in true Christian transformation from a life of sin to a life of godliness is the mind. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 demonstrated this to be so. Paul instructed that you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you are dedicated to living according to the golden rule, it will surely transform your thoughts. First, it's transformational for your thoughts in focus. The Bible speaks about the importance of your focus. For instance, in Proverbs 23 and verse 7, it says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Therefore, what you choose to focus on or what fills your heart or mind is what you will often find impacting your life, either for the better or the worse. Jesus also puts the focus on focus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. He said that your focus should not be on the earthly treasures because they will not last. Instead, your focus should be on the the spiritual, the heavenly treasures that are eternal. And then he warns about having more than one focus in life, saying that no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, verse 24. Ultimately, Jesus instructs you in verse 33 to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, even above putting your focus on the pursuit of your physical needs like food and drink and clothing. Now, I want you to think about 
what applying the golden rule to your life will do to your focus. If your desire is to treat others how you would want them to treat you, your focus must be on them. So you must go from a self-centered focus to a selfless focus. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4 helps to understand the kind of selfless focus God wants you to have. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And then you could continue reading verses 5 through 11 to see that this is exactly the kind of humble and selfless focus that Jesus Christ had in leaving heaven, coming to earth, living as man, and dying on the cross. Your focus cannot be on your own desires and pleasing yourself if you're going to live according to the golden rule. It requires you to focus on how other people feel. Things that other people need and desire. How other people will interpret what is done, etc. So living this way tries to see things through the the eyes of the people who you are around rather than just from your own selfish perspective. You will want to focus on others just as you would like others to focus on you. And then this is a transformational commandment for your thoughts and your judgments. One of the ways in which people often hurt others is by making rash, irresponsible, and false judgments about others. You see, the judgments that you make about others impact how you treat them. So you must consider how the golden rule will transform the judgments that you form in your private thoughts. Jesus teaches the need to be careful how you judge others. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 says, Judge not that you be not judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, a closer study of this passage demonstrates that Jesus is not forbidding all judgments from being made. Instead, his primary concern is hypocritical judgments, as you can see in verses 3 through 5. But even in this, you should see that you must consider how you would want others to judge you. Jesus also taught about making the proper judgments in John chapter 7 and verse 24. When others were trying to judge Jesus in an improper way, Jesus said, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So from this, we can conclude that there are right judgments that should and must be made, as the scriptures teach us on many different occasions. However, we must be very careful how we judge. It is far too common for folks not to consider others whenever they make judgments. They often reach rash conclusions because they do not weigh out all of the evidence. Perhaps they judge based only on appearance. Perhaps they judge based only on hearsay or gossip. Perhaps they judge based on only having part of the information. Perhaps they judge based on their own suppositions. Perhaps their judgment is without mercy. And then... After forming a rash judgment, they often pass those judgments along to others. Now, not only does this violate what Jesus teaches about making judgments, but it also violates the golden rule. Certainly, you would never desire to have those kinds of judgments made about you. Surely, you would desire others to come to you for your side of the story before drawing conclusions. And therefore, the golden rule will transform your thoughts about other people because you will consider them in making judgments. Next, this is a transformational commandment for your thoughts in recognizing opportunities. It is far too easy to get caught up in our own lives, in our own worries, in our own pleasures, etc., and fail to have any consideration for others. And thus, there are many opportunities to serve encourage, and do good to others that pass by unnoticed because our focus is not in the right place. So as you put your focus on others, this will cause you to recognize the opportunities that are all around you to do good to others and treat them in the way that you would desire to be treated yourself. Think about Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 and verses 25 through 37. In lesson one, we studied how the Samaritan recognized his opportunity to do good to the man who fell among thieves. And we considered how the priest and Levite passed him by without helping. 
Now, Jesus does not tell us the reason why they did not help the man and show him love. I suppose there could have been any number of reasons these two two men did not help. But as you make application of the parable, you should consider if there are ever times when you could be passing someone by and failing to act in their best interest because you are not even looking for opportunities to do good to them. Maybe you're in a hurry to get somewhere. Maybe you're focused on your own schedule. Maybe you're concerned about your own worries. Maybe you're lost in your own pleasures. It's interesting and encouraging to me to recognize that God only expects from us what we are capable of giving to Him. He does not expect more than I am capable of giving Him, but He also does not accept anything less. And therefore, this means that you should be looking for every opportunity that is available to you. In Galatians 6 and verse 10, it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And if you're living by the golden rule, you'll be so focused on others that you will recognize the opportunities that are given to you to do what is good to them. You'll be looking to do good to others as you want others to look for the opportunities to do good to you. Next, the golden rule is a transformational commandment for your words. The transformation that is experienced due to the golden rule needs to begin in the mind. Your thoughts should be on others rather than just on yourself. You should be thinking about how about others, how you want them to think about you. And then this transformation in thought extends to a transformation in words. For you must recognize that your words are very powerful to others. James 3, verses 1 through 12. They have the power to either help or destroy. So it's transformational for your words and that you'll be speaking words of truth. Speaking the complete truth must be the commitment that is made by everyone who's a Christian. Since God is a God of truth, Titus 1 verse 2 and Hebrews 6 and verse 18, he certainly expects this from those who follow him. So this is routinely reflected in the scriptures. And in application of the golden rule, you should be committed to speaking the truth because you surely want want others to speak the truth to you. For instance, when Paul speaks concerning the transformation of those who become Christians, he said in Ephesians 4 and verse 25, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then Romans chapter 1 and verse 29 lists deceit as something that is deserving of death. Romans 1 verse 32. Notice the things that are unacceptable to God and that fail to fulfill the golden rule. You must not lie or deceive. Both condemn any practice of saying things that are not true or that leads another to a false conclusion. Sometimes this happens by just blatantly saying something that is false. Other times this happens by giving misleading information. For instance, on two separate occasions, Abraham told that people that his wife, Sarah, was his sister, Genesis 12 and, and 20. Now, this was technically true. She was his half-sister. However, he purposely misled them by failing to say she was also his wife. There are many circumstances in which you might be tempted to be untruthful. Maybe you want to keep the peace with someone, so you tell him or her a lie. Maybe you want to flatter someone, so you stretch the truth to make him or her feel good. Maybe you are afraid of the consequences the truth will bring, so you lead another to draw a false conclusion based on the truth. Now, the golden rule demands that you consider whether you want to be misled by others, or whether you want people to always be completely honest with you. For it's not enough just not to lie and deceive, but you must also speak the truth, even when the truth is not pleasant. Then, this is a transformational commandment for your words, and that you'll be speaking words of edification. If you were to describe how most people speak about others, would you say that they speak in selfish ways or in ways that are in the best interest of others? 
How many times do you and others speak words that harm those who hear you? The simple fact of the matter is that God wants you to be transformed in your speech, and following the golden rule will go a long way to accomplish that. Ephesians 4 and verse 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. You must set a guard at your mouth, never allowing your tongue to harm someone else. Now, this does not mean that you must never allow your words to cause someone to feel bad, for there are plenty of times when the truth will make people feel bad. Instead, this means that you must never allow yourself to speak words that do not meet God's standards for your speech. And furthermore, true edification, according to how the word is used in the scriptures, refers to building up others spiritually. It's not always equal to a good feeling. In fact, sometimes you will need to tell people that they're sinning against God. Still, even though they may not like what you say, you edify them because you helped identify sin in their lives so that they can make changes and be right with God. Just think about all the ways people speak words that are harmful, physically or spiritually. People speak words of unproven accusation. People gossip about others. People speak out of anger. People speak without thinking. People speak in hateful ways. But in accordance with the golden rule, you should be considerate in the words that you speak. You should question whether each word will build someone up or tear someone down, spiritually speaking. You should put yourself in the situation of another and consider what you would need someone to say to you and how you would want him or her to say it. In all things, your speech must be such that it draws others toward God rather than push them away from Him. Next, this is a transformational commandment for your words because you'll speak words of love. Speaking the truth in words that edify is only part of how you should speak to others. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 also adds the responsibility of speaking the truth in love. Now, this implies that it is possible to speak the truth in ways that are not right. In fact, I would suggest to you that there are many Christians who harm people with the truth. Even as it pertains to teaching, to preaching the gospel and correcting sin, many Christians do not harness their zeal for God with the proper degree of love. So they rebuke others without any consideration of how they would want others to rebuke them. They so-called preach to others in ways that they would not want others to teach them. In doing so, they push people further away from God and the truth. When Jesus sent out his twelve apostles on a limited commission, we might call it, to the house of Israel in Matthew chapter 10, he told them in verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So speaking the truth is only one part of what God wants from us. He also wants us to do no harm and be wise in our conduct and conversation toward others. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 will prove to be extremely helpful whenever you consider how you can speak the truth in love. In describing the things love does, Paul says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's verses 4 through 7. Isn't this exactly how you desire for folks to speak to you? Don't you want them to speak in patient ways, in kind ways, in ways that are not about their own selfish desires and egos, in ways that are not rude, in ways that do not provoke an emotional response in you that would be ungodly, in ways that give you the benefit of the doubt rather than assume your guilt, in ways that rejoice whenever you do what is right, in ways that demonstrate trust and hope. Therefore, if this is how you want others to speak to you, you must also speak to them in the same kind of ways, according to God's standard of love. 
Next, the golden rule is a transformational commandment in that it is transformational for your conduct. Love should describe every part of how you think and talk about others and to others. But it only starts there. Everything about how you conduct yourself must be described by love, as we saw from 1 Corinthians 13. The golden rule will surely transform your life regarding how you conduct yourself toward others. For instance, in demonstrating mercy, one of the most difficult things any person can be asked to do for another is to show mercy. Mercy involves compassion for another, and the word is especially used in the scriptures to talk about forgiveness. Mercy does not give someone what is truly deserved. Everyone who lives long enough on this earth experiences wrong and suffering. But this is not always just due to the circumstances of living on this earth. Instead, it is sometimes the direct result of someone else's sin. Sometimes people say things that cause us to suffer. Sometimes people think things that cause us to suffer. And sometimes people do things that cause us to suffer. And then there are differing degrees to which people cause us to suffer. Sometimes the things that are done against us are quickly forgotten and moved on from. However, there are things that people do against us that truly leave lasting scars. And especially in these situations, it is easy to fall for the temptation of seeking revenge or holding on to the wrong that was committed and never moving on. Yet Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 14 and 15, for if, you do not forgive, for if you forgive men their trespasses, their he- your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And there are no limits to this forgiveness that you should offer to others, as you can see in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Just as God has offered you limitless forgiveness whenever you ask him, You must extend the same kind of forgiveness to those who have wronged you. Now let me also be clear that the forgiveness God expects you to extend to others concerns situations in which your forgiveness is being sought. For even God does not forgive if his forgiveness is not sought. Now consider how you want others to treat you in this regard. Whenever you realize that you have wronged someone else and caused suffering, Do you want him or her to hold on to your sin for the rest of his or her life? Or do you want an opportunity to start over? Even though you recognize that you do not deserve to start over, this is what you desire. So if you're going to treat others according to the golden rule, this is how you must treat them. Next, the golden rule is transformational for your conduct in that it demonstrates kindness. Kindness is such a broad idea and, and is hard to define. But it's something that we all recognize. It is gentleness and consideration of others. Unfortunately, much of the way in which the world treats other people gets lacks genuine kindness. In fact, much of their conduct demonstrates rudeness. Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 32 says, And be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Oh, there is, there is some overlap between this point and the last one. I think this one challenges us to go even further. The contrast in this verse is to the actions, the kinds of actions that are described by verse 31. Christians must let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking with all malice be put away from them. These are to be replaced with kindness, tender-heartedness, and forgiveness. I like the word tender-hearted. How many times do we see people in this world who are hard-hearted? It is so familiar with, to us that we know what this looks like all too well. It is when people have no consideration of others. But a tender heart means that the way in which other people are treated impacts you. Your heart can be tr- penetrated by their feelings. You must remember that one of the characteristics of true love is that love is kind, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4. So if your actions do not show kindness, and if your speech is not with kindness, then you don't love that person. And if you don't love that person, your life is not acceptable to God, no matter how many other good things you may do in serving Jesus Christ 
1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. Now, you must consider how you desire other people to treat you. Do you want their hearts to be so hard against you that they do not care how you feel or about what you need? Or do you want their hearts to be soft enough that your life really matters to them? Don't you prefer someone to show you acts of kindness and tenderness, even if they are very small gestures, rather than to act with selfishness and rudeness? If so, the golden rule makes it necessary that you act in the same way, the same kind and tender ways toward others. And then the golden rule also transforms our conduct in that it demonstrates care. Part of being tender-hearted and kind is showing people that you care about them. But while there are even small and relatively insignificant ways you can be kind to people, I want you to think about, I want you to think more about helping and serving people at this point. Again, think about the good Samaritan in Jesus' parable. He cared enough about a complete stranger that he did what he was capable of doing to help the man. We've already seen that Galatians 6 and verse 10 requires Christians to take advantage of their opportunities to do good to to all, especially those who who are also Christians. Now, there are many ways in which we can do good to other people. For the purposes of this lesson, we'll just be considering the physical ways you can do good, as we'll consider spiritual things in the next lesson. I think we often overlook the specifics of what Jesus taught about the Judgment Day in Matthew 25 and verses 31 through 46. Although there are some general applications we should make about the righteous and the unrighteous, we should not overlook the specific criteria Jesus states in this passage. He speaks about feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty something to drink, taking in strangers, clothing the naked, and visiting the sick and those in prison. While there are other ways to do good to people, this is a good start. There are people who have physical needs living around you. And as we considered earlier, you should be focused on recognizing these opportunities. And then you must not just dismiss yourself of any responsibility to them. Instead, you should do the most that you can with your opportunities. For Jesus said, if you don't do these good things to others, you do not do them to him. And if you do not do these good things to others, you do not do them to him. Now consider yourself in the situation of those who have a physical need. If you were hungry and had no means to provide for yourself or your family something to eat, wouldn't you want someone to feed you and your family? If you were so poor that you had insufficient clothing, wouldn't you want someone to give you an extra set of their clothes or buy you your own set? If you were sick and unable to get out of the house or were in prison, the hospital, or in the nursing home, wouldn't you want someone to come and visit you? So if you would want others to do these kinds of good things to you and show you that they care about you, the golden rule makes it necessary that you do the same for others. I'm sure that there are other things we could consider regarding how the golden rule will transform your thoughts, your words, and your conduct, but I believe you have the point. Up to this point, we have been talking generically about how we should treat others. Now I want you to start putting faces with these others and applying the golden rule to your specific relationships. For there is no book on relationships, advice column, counselor, etc., who will do more to transform your relationships than God. And the golden rule will go a long way in accomplishing this. So let's first think about your neighbors. Jesus taught that your neighbor is anyone you have the opportunity to show love toward. Go back and review the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. It is not limited to the people who live in your physical neighborhood. For instance, there is no mention of the Good Samaritan having any prior relationship with the wounded man. In fact, I believe the two were strangers. Yet Jesus taught this parable in order to answer the question, And who is my neighbor? Luke 10, verse 29. So Jesus expects you to love and apply the golden rule to all of your neighbors. This includes the people in your neighborhood, 
But it also includes strangers you come into contact with. It includes your friends, your adversaries, which we'll talk about more in a moment, your coworkers, your classmates, your acquaintances, and everyone you contact. Now, just imagine if you applied the golden rule in such a complete kind of way. Everyone you came into contact with would, would be treated with love and respect and kindness and would be, be, would be better off than if they had not come into contact with you. Next, this is transformational for your relationships concerning your enemies. Sometimes it's fairly easy to apply the golden rule. But even those in the world who often live according to the brass rule of getting even can sometimes deal kindly with those who are kind to them. The real test of the golden rule is when you're not treated with love, dignity, and kindness. But still, Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes this, his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who, are, who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The fact of the matter is that the golden rule applies to how you treat everyone. So you must be committed to applying all that we've been studying in these lessons to those who hate you and want to see you destroyed. Now just imagine if your enemies who want to harm you were treated according to the golden rule. Rather than harming them in return, you would only act in ways that were beneficial for them physically and spiritually. Next, this is a transformational commandment for your relationships concerning your brethren. Christians are part of a spiritual family. And not only is God their father, but all Christians are their brothers and sisters. It is very sad that these brothers and sisters often harm each other and how they think, speak, and act toward one another. Sometimes this causes hard feelings, division in local churches, and even brothers and sisters falling into sin. Yet God has given Christians the responsibility to love one another, not just in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. 1 John 3, verse 18. And there are many responsibilities that the Christian has toward all of his or her brothers and sisters in Christ. For instance, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Now just imagine if you applied the golden rule to every brother and sister in Jesus Christ, not just those who are easy to get along with but also to the difficult ones. Rather than fighting and dividing, you would only act in ways that were beneficial to them. And finally, this is a transformational commandment for your relationships in your family. Every member of the family has the responsibility to love all the other members of the family. However, selfishness can creep into the home unaware and wreak havoc on the home. It can turn husbands and wives into great enemies. It can separate the bond that should exist between parents and children. Beyond this, siblings and many other family relationships are often destroyed because of a failure to love and apply the golden rule. Yet we have seen that God expects you to love your neighbor, which includes every member of your family you encounter. This means that you must act like the Good Samaritan toward every member of your family, no matter how they act toward you. Now just imagine if you apply the golden rule to every member of your family. Rather than contributing to the problems of the family, you would always be part of the solution because you would only act in ways that were beneficial for all of the others. As we close this study, if you want your thoughts, words, and conduct toward others to have God's approval, you must allow them to be transformed by the golden rule. And it is not enough just to pick and choose who you desire to show this kind of love toward. 
Instead, you must apply the golden rule to everyone you come into contact with. No exceptions. If you will, you will be pleasing to God in this area of your life no matter how other people treat you.